it's easy to make bad game assets quickly in Blender, especially when you're trying to just get something in the engine as fast as possible. Quick, 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 quick. This seems fast at the time, but it leads to problems you'll have to fix later. This simple cone, for instance, results in three draw calls when it really only needs to be one. This approach also starts to clutter your asset library quickly with many different materials, inevitably leading to duplicates. Furthermore, everything you just made is a one-time, standalone asset that can't be easily reused elsewhere. Let's go over how we can tackle this asset to make it efficient, accurate, and as reusable as possible. Reference. Reference is king. Before you even open Blender, take the time to gather reference material. I usually look for several types. Reference for the actual shape and form of the object. Reference for the texture and materials, the plastic glossiness, rubber roughness, reflective tape details. Reference showing the object in its typical environment or context is really important too. Study these references to fully understand the object you're about to create. Looking at the reference, I first identify the broad shapes and the details. For example, I see that the cone isn't just a straight taper. There are distinct shapes or indentations in the profile. Adding these details will make the final asset more visually interesting and believable. For the materials, it looks like we need to represent three main surfaces. The rough rubber base, the reflective strips, often with a specific pattern, and of course, the glossy orange plastic body. Make sure you also find the real world dimensions of the asset. A quick Google search usually does the trick. Modeling. Now we're ready to jump into Blender and start modeling. We'll begin by setting up our reference image within Blender for guidance. Then we can add a cube for the base. First we can move the origin point to the bottom of the cube and clear its location. This will make sure that the base sits on the ground plane. Before going further, let's ensure our scale is correct. Scale the reference image to the real world size we found earlier. Working to scale from the start of the asset makes the whole process easier. Now scale the cube to the dimensions of the cone's base according to the reference. For the main body of the cone, we'll add a cylinder. When adding cylinders, many people use the default 32 divisions without thinking. However, choosing a lower count, like 24 versus 32, can significantly impact performance when this asset is duplicated many times over the entire level later on. Also, consider how close the player will actually get to the asset and choose the minimum resolution needed to maintain the silhouette. I think 24 divisions will be sufficient in this case. Now, scale and position the cylinder's base and tip vertices to match the cone's profile in the reference. We can delete the top and bottom faces for now, as they won't be visible or needed. Right-click the object and select Shade Auto Smooth for clean shading. Add a few loop cuts along the cone's height and scale the faces that will be the reflective strips with Alt-S to create the indentation seen in the reference. Select the edge loops and bevel them slightly to soften the transition and improve how light catches the edges. To create the interior, select the top edge loop and extrude it slightly inwards to create a lip. Then extrude again and move it down towards the base. Scale it outwards to maintain the cone wall's thickness. The bottom lip near the base can be created in a couple of simple extrusions as well. For the base itself, select the vertical corner edges and bevel them with a larger radius and multiple segments to round them off. Give the top edge of the base a small chamfer. Finally, we can model the feet. These can be simple cube shapes positioned under the base. Chamfer the edges and ensure that they are also shaded smooth. I make sure to duplicate these with Alt-D instead of Shift-D so that they are linked instances. This way, if I UV unwrap or modify the mesh on one foot, all of the duplicates will be automatically updated as well. And that's it for the modeling phase. UV unwrapping and material setup. At this point, I like to do an initial UV unwrap. This helps visualize how the texture space might be allocated 
and identify good potential seam locations before committing to the final layout. When making seams, I think about where natural material breaks occur and where I can hide the seams from the player's typical view, like the back of the cone here. We can manually adjust these precisely once we have our final material and texture layout defined. The material will be made up of three different sections, the reflective strips, the orange cone body, and the rubber base. Now that we have the basic layout of our texture, we can manually adjust the UV islands in the editor. For example, I'll select the faces for the reflective strips, straighten their UVs, and scale and place them precisely on the reflective strip area of our texture. I'll do the same for the orange plastic parts, scaling their UVs to fit the designated orange plastic area. and likewise for the base sections, placing them into the rubber part of the trim sheet. At this point, we have a version of our cone ready to test in the game engine. The material itself involves creating a trim sheet texture. That's a deeper topic, but if you'd like a dedicated video on creating this specific trim sheet material, let me know in the comments. Otherwise, the final blend file for this whole tutorial will be available for free on my coffee page. The link is in the description below. Conclusion. So next time you need to add an asset to your game, resist the urge to just throw something together. Instead, take these extra minutes up front gathering reference, planning your materials, using efficient techniques like trim sheets, consider draw calls, and model thoughtfully. You'll thank yourself later when the asset inevitably needs to be reused, iterated upon, or adapted in ways you didn't initially anticipate. Optimizing like this not only improves performance, but also makes your asset library much more flexible and maintainable.